All right, and all of a sudden the series is tied. The series is tied one to one, and I don't know about you guys, but I was under the impression that individual team members for Team Tempest fell extremely quickly here in this game. What happened, Jayho? I, I mean, E-Star basically singled out every time they had a chance, they capitalized on it, and it shows in their gameplay. We're going to be able to see some highlights that are going to blow your mind, but the fact that they made the plays happen, they even countered some of the stuff that Tempest was trying to do, like the Mighty Gust. They were like, you want to do this? You get a kill? Guess what? We're in position. We're still coming in. It was crazy. I mean, the map control that we saw established by Easter was insane. At some point, we had 175 <laughs> gems on the side of the Korean team. <laughs> they just never could go into the middle of the map and turn them in. It was tough. I mean, every step of the way, Eastar, no matter what happened, even when things looked dire, they still performed. It was... I, I can't wait to get to the replays, guys. Tempest are known for their team fight, but the Chinese teams are known for their rotation. What better yeah. map here uh, than Tumor the Spider Queen to just kind of run around and... Uh, try to catch somebody here and there and have the, the perfect map control than this one. Really, there isn't one. Absolutely, and I'm sure that's also going to be part of the first replay that Jayhao is now going to bring to you guys. Well, this is the part where I'm talking about we're going to see Falstad fly in. He instantly gets in position to try and get a mighty gust, and he's going to go ahead and throw that out. Or excuse me, that's where the barrel roll. They're trying to force him to fight under the towers. Now, this looks good early on, but there's a certain person named ETC. Now, let's roll it back and see how this played out, because right there you can see the mosh pit. But that is where this fight turns around. As we roll it forward, he is right in the thick of things. There's so much action going on all over the place. But the mosh pit comes out, catches to it gets cleansed but as you can see Falstad walks right into it catches two on the backside we do see Muradin very deep the problem is that he's so deep he's not going to have a way out the execution as you can see Tiger diving in everybody going in full four seven sided strike not enough Muradin trying to back out and this is something that we see once more he backs out but nice bone prison in by Zul and this is going to lead them to come in and capitalize the gems I believe do get picked up actually they don't get picked up but this is where they, they fought over and over again, and you just see the capitalization. Yes, they were in a bad position, but they fought them. They fought their way out of it. It was a very awkward position, in my opinion. They had a talent disadvantage, and they still went in. And also, the use of the Wandering Keg and the Mighty Gust just seemed to be yeah, off there. I mean, yeah. it felt like they were starting with the Wandering Keg, then Shen was like, help. I need someone <laughs> to help me out here because this is not working. And then Falsa was like, I got you. That's two heroics down. They are talent down. Fight turns against yeah. them, and they lose more than they gained. There were a lot of comfort picks, by the way, in this drafting game. Lockdown was on his fast start, his beloved fast start, on which he's 9-0 and zero right now, by the way, or was on 9-0 and zero before this point. game. He's finally lost on it. But on the other side, Tiger loves his fast start. Shouty loves to make everybody dance on the EPC. <laughs> and the Tigers, they wanted it, they got it, and it worked for them. And maybe we get to see a little bit of Tigers action in replay number two. I, I was talking about this backstage. Dredd came over to me and he said, this could be the play of the tournament. We're going to get to it here in just a minute. But this is where the fight started to come into play. Look at, we have Greymane, everybody going in, but Sundering, seven-sided strike. The Mighty Gust just a little bit too late. It isolates the rest of the team. Let's pause it. 65 gems, guys. He looks fine. Murden's fine. Murden's <laughs> unkillable. Rest of the team going this way. Let's keep the rest of his team protected. Let's go ahead and see what happens here. This is... This is why you are here in the top four. He's stunned. He's still alive. He's going to be fine, right, guys? He goes, he creates a little bit of disruption, hops over, pause it. He's fine, right, Kaldor? No, he's not. I'm going to show you why. <laughs> this guy right here, Tiger. Now, as soon as Hong is going to go ahead and let's move it forward very slowly. I want you guys to see this. This is where, <laughs> this is just so perfect. Totem? Shield? Hey, Hong, we see you're trying to dismount, but guess what? There's a shield on this totem. <laughs> Throws it over the wall, dismounts him, roll it forward. I want you guys to see exactly what happens. That is 65 gems. That is a dead Murden 17 minutes into the game. The shield allows him, or does not allow him to mount there. Keeps him from mounting. He's forced to go on a rotate. You'll see the camera come back down. And now he is all by himself. They rotate down. That is phenomenal play by Tiger on Rhaegar. And it looks very easy to do in slow mode, but right? But when you are in the in the middle of battle, split second you have decision. to react within split second, as you mentioned, J. I, I, I yeah. can't. When I saw that, I was going crazy, and then Dread runs over. He's like, "Did you get that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I did." <laughs> that was incredible, dude. I loved it. 
Chen also not really having that impact that he had no. in the previous game. The lack of Abatha was quite telling. Also, this time you're playing against a cleanse, of course, so you're not going to get as much value out of your barrel as you would in another game. And yeah, Easter just dominated with that wave clear in particular, the middle of the map. And if you deny turn to your opponent, then that's just it on Tomb of the Spider Queen. First pick, Zul. Yeah, and all of a sudden the race for the Grand Finals has turned a lot more exciting. For now though, we're gonna let you know what the third battleground of this best of five is going to be. And of course, we see Cursed Hollow being chosen. A very interesting battleground, I mean, not being played as frequently as it used to be, but still, it allows for crazy and funky rotations, especially in late game. Absolutely, with uh, the matches yeah, being best of five, you have a... Yeah. You have more options, I guess. You're going to see more maps, obviously. And with this map coming into play here, and one of the team being known for team fighting and the other one for rotations, we could be seeing Eastar gain some more momentum and potentially doing really well as well. We talk about the Chinese bush meta if you're looking to, to, to punish <laughs> rotations. This is a good map to do it on. Another thing that already excites me is we have a 1-1, meaning we are going to see the fourth <laughs> yeah. map, and that is going to be once again Towers of Doom. And if we get another tie, then it is going to be Garden of Terror, and that would, of course, be the dream here. And look at that. Yeah. Another Tassadar bun against Duck Duck. And which race did he play in StarCraft 2 again? <laughs> he played Protoss with so the item <laughs> boss. What happened Tassadar, here yeah. is they basically identified that uh, force fields are still imbalanced, and uh, they're getting rid of them right away. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't change. It did not change. <laughs> well, I, I just, in Legacy of the Void, there is new units that are pretty good, but in I, Heroes of the Storm, that force wall, man, is pretty I, scary. I and they wanna, use it so well. I want to point out what this opens up, and a hero that we've seen quite a bit on the larger maps, particularly Cursed Hollow, is Zeratul. And when you have somebody like Tassadar to be able to have that oracle for that vision, it takes that away. Yeah. So I think it opens the door. Obviously, I think a few more things need to play out in the draft, but I wouldn't be surprised if they try and at least gear or leave that door open later in the draft. And Tempest have to be worried about going into some kind of double warrior, you know? When you have a team that's so comfortable with picking up a Tychus and punishing, it's going to be very hard for them to deal with this. Yeah. I mean, like, talking warriors. First of all, we started with that pick on Falstead. Now we have Muradin. Falstead with a huge value that he has on Cursed Hollow. He's like the king of Cursed Hollow. You have a very nice mobility. You can fly in later tributes, allowing right. you extra soak for the team. The two bosses giving him, of course, an opportunity to steal them away, or at least call, control position around the bosses if you're going into the fights. What about Abaster here? Are we going to see the, it's possible. the slug life come out here and happen <laughs> on this map? It is a fantastic Abatha map. If you play Abatha, this is the map to do it. Or Sky Temple, those two are probably the most popular Abatha maps that we have in the pool right now. And I expect a Greymane to be picked up very early. And then when we have a Greymane, an Abatha is always an option laid on in the draft to get that huge pressure during the team fights. I wouldn't be surprised if Tychus comes out again. You talk about putting the laser down any, anywhere around the tribute to be able to help deny it. Yeah. I, I think yeah. there's so much on board, but Greymane obviously being much higher priority than a Tychus. I, I love the call right here. Yeah, so Greymane is already taken, but you're totally right on that Tychus call. If you go for the laser, you have very nice control during the Curse Tribute fights, and that is really important on a map like this. Tyrande was banned earlier in the previous game, uh, in the second banning phase, I believe. We could see her come out here as well. Li Ming, still an option, even though we haven't seen much of her. I, 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 just, I just assume that Li Ming doesn't exist anymore because I haven't seen her in so long. Tyrande is actually a very good point at Todd Razors now. Now, the reason that she was picked on the last map was that they were afraid of the rotations. With Zul already being picked, with ETC picked, Tyrande would have just been too much to make these rotations even more dangerous. But normally, especially when we're looking at the Western scene, Cursed Hollow was one of these maps, or is one of these maps, where Turanda most of the time is being chosen because of the interrupt potential and the scouting potential. You see what happens at the boss and you can interrupt tribute channels. But still, in this tournament, on this map, Turanda sees like nearly no play so far. And E-Star banned Tychus here, so they might be playing some sort of multiple warrior composition themselves. Tempest banned Uther with uh, their upcoming picks here, and I mean, they've already uh, got Rhaegar themselves, so they're going to limit the choices here in terms of hitter for Eastar and kind of bottleneck them into you a very few choices. Todd, you mentioned a potential double warrior come for Eastar this time. Which warrior would make a lot of sense going in with an ETC? Uh, I, I, I'm really not sure. I mean, we have uh, two Anubarak. options. Sonya, Anubarak, Sonya. both of them would really cater towards those needs. You can dive deep, you have also yeah. a lot of sustain during the fight. It, it depends a bit on the healer. But there is no one that really stands out, right? 
I guess. I feel both of the two could be being played. This is not really one on the European meta where even uh, something like uh, Stitches would have been a choice. Ethereal, depending on how aggressive you want to be with the comp, is an option, but Tempest already picked that away. I really think still that if we're going to see a second wall, it's either going to be that Sony or that Nubarak. What's always cool, we talked about Tassadar with the Force Wall at 16. We have Tyrael with Holy Ground, and that allows to make plays in these tight choke points that oh, yeah. Kaldor was talking about earlier. I mean, they're very narrow gaps, and if you can isolate somebody with that, uh, then I, I think uh, Tyrael is a good pickup. It's just they need some damage, though. And they need to start getting it now. I'm just curious if they're going to try and stick more toward their range or whether they're going to try uh, something with a strong front Kalfas line. Kalfas here, anyone? Who? Please? Never heard of him. Yeah, we haven't seen him in this draft yet. <laughs> There's Karazin, first of all. But let, let's touch on that Sonya for a moment. Because Tempest is basically doing something that we've seen from the Chinese teams a lot. They go into a heavy melee composition. And they are trying now to enable that with that Sang. We've been talking about it all week. You go in, you drop that Sang, Sonya moves in as well, you force the fight. When Easter does it, they have a Zool so that they can force it with a Bone Prison. Right now, they're still potential to move away. And the one thing that I'm a bit worried about is that Easter simply uses in these situations false that to gust the opponent away, and all of a sudden, it's a reset on the fight, and Tyrael is in cooldown. Sanctification, though, will be the deciding factor. If he plays yes. the Sanctification well, that neutralizes what uh, what Mighty Gust does. But if it leaves his, his heroes behind him, that's what could be scary. But that's the moment. You just wait for them to just move out a little bit, and then you buy yourself the time, and then you have Tyrael on the cooldown. So, of course, you're totally right. They have to time it perfectly to make it happen. But I feel they're good enough to do that. Kendrick made a good point. Kel'Thas still on the board. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the last pick by Tempest. Li Ming, I think, is still a good pick here if you want to help poke along those tributes. She has such good range on her Arcane Orb, on her Magic Missiles. I think one of the two really fits with their composition well. But we've been surprised so far the fact that right. Kel'Thas is this late and we haven't seen Li Ming in what feels like two days. It's just so interesting to see Eastar ban Tychus and then Tempest being like, oh, yeah, Tychus is gone. Let's just go warrior heavy ourselves. They're not going to be She does themselves. exist. I feel yeah, I go. found her. And she gets prioritized over Kel'Thas there. I, but I like it on this they, map they because of the range. They need her, I feel, here. They need the poke. They also need the burst that they have on it, especially with the melee heavy setup that they have at the front line. And so far, losing the poke bag around the, 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 sorry, the tributes, I think Li Ming is a, like the perfect choice for them in this game. Yeah, Kel'Thas has to kind of get in that weird mid-range to land the gravity laps. He yes. puts himself in vulnerable positions where Li Ming stays way, way back and just pokes, pokes, pokes. I think that Kaldor made a good play. That's the best choice right and here. You have another interrupt, of course, as well, if you go for the way of a force. Yes, that's true. We're looking at ETC once again on the other side, and when you have that mosh pit there, that is a good call. I, I think this is a perfect call. Is, and, there, and uh, is there a significant difference in why, or in how Korean players play Li Ming, or do you think it doesn't really matter which region you're from, Li Ming certainly has a similar play style? Well, somewhere out there, Crowen's happy. I mean, that's without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, I, it's just weird, the, the prioritization in other scenes, Li Ming is highly prioritized. And here, in the last few days, where we've seen a lot of Korean and Chinese teams, they just haven't picked her. I mean, she's just been off the, off the table for quite a while, but making a return, Cursed Hollow is a perfect map for her. Curse Hall is actually great for her right now, but I still have to say that I like the draft that Easter has put out there. It's very, very solid. It's very well-rounded, too. They need to be careful with ETC at the front line, that's for certain, but they have Thrall here, and especially on Cursed. If you play patient, those Sundering flanks are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, by the same token that we mentioned it, the potential sanctification can maybe prove some problems, but do you think that alone will be enough to stop that onslaught from Easter Gaming Talk? Uh, it's all going to be about the engagements, and Tempest have shown that they are masterful with those. And Eastar's composition doesn't really strike me as one that will be as comfortable compared to the previous game. To roam around, try to make some catches, you know, you were talking about the, bush, the party bushes, uh, to do some good ambush. There is some decent escape as well on, uh, on Tempest's draft, so I don't, I don't mind it too much here. I think they did okay. I actually have to say that with this particular setup, um, the Sangs this tournament, we have seen some fantastic ones, but overall I was disappointed, and I don't think it's going to be enough. All right, uh, let's get to prediction, boys. Todd, why don't you give us a start? I'm going to go for Tempest here against, uh, against all odds. <laughs> I think they're going to take this map here. I like their draft. Right. Uh, yeah. I called Easter last game. I'm saying it again. Easter makes it. Jao. Uh, give me Tempest. Give me Li Ming. I'm going to tell you guys she's the one to look out for. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about Tempest here because everything's online for Tyrael, a lot of weight on his shoulders, so I'm going for E-Star Gaming. I think they have a really nice comp to force a decision here, so that's my tip. Anyway though, Gillyweed and Kalaris, they're getting ready to cast this map here for you guys, so stay tuned and enjoy Cursed Hollow.
Thank you very much, Kendrick. And things are getting hype here at DreamHack Summer as we are about to get into game at number three between Tempest and E-Star. What a draft between these two as well. Denials here and there. Taking Tyrael away from I loved it. Let's get into game number three as we have. Spawning to the left-hand side, it will be Tempest with Duck Duck on Tyrael, Hyde on Rhaegar, Lockdown on Lee Ming, Dami on Sonya, and finally Hong Kono will be on the Muradin. And in the red, we have Team E Star Gaming with Tiger playing Karzim, Zhao Ti on ETC, Jinxie playing Greymane, Nightshaw on Thrall, and False Ad played by Toomey. And yeah, you and I talked about how uh, how Tempest invested a lot into stopping E Star's protect the Greymane composition, mm. banning Uther. Stealing away Tyrael. My question is, was it too much? And I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, we shall already uh, NC here. Going for a block with Thrall. And no surprise against this heavy melee comp uh, that we're seeing on the other side here with Sonya, Muradin, and Tyrael trying to barrel down on them. Remember, Sonya is still technically a warrior. So I guess you could still call this a three warrior composition. But Sonya, yeah, she fits. She fits other roles, let's be honest. Even force armor for Li Ming. So a lot of defensive talents coming out on both sides. Material did get Herodric Reforging. My favorite Tyrael level one talent means that you have a lot more Eldrin's Might, so more mobility once you can get, uh, yeah. once you have that. And then later on, the potential for more often to have holy oh. grounds. NC able to dodge that storm bolt so well, and that is going to mean a kill on the other side. Muradin ends up falling just based on that dodge alone from NC. So, so masterful. Oh, man. The NC dodging him by the skin of his teeth. But yeah, they're going to get first blood off of that, and they might be able to get more. They're going for the fight. Toomey coming in. Dami is in trouble. Whirlwinding. Spinning to win and to safety. Spin, spin, spin. And NC will have to retreat away down towards that bottom position there. Both the teams have lost a little bit of soak towards mid, uh, while the fight rages on up to the top with Tyrael and Karazim. Not too much craziness going on there. Duck Duck hasn't even expended much of his mana at all. So you can see kind of the friendly, gentlemanly rivalry up towards the top. It's like, yeah, I'll push, you'll push. Nobody will use any mana. It's fine. We're going to see a lot of people in lane, especially Toomey as he has picked up seasoned marksmen. So he'll be working on getting those stacks so later on he can do a lot more, have more uh, attack speed once he can get that activatable. Yep, yep. All right, so Toomey just going to stall that out towards the mid. And uh, even Horostrick, uh, um, uh, the Eldruins might even, I should say, being thrown towards the middle of that. And actually, Eldruins might is actually quite mana costly. It is. It really so is. Using that in the middle of that lane means that Duck Duck is at a slight disadvantage here against Karazim. Well, both teams are trying to get level four to be ready for the first tribute fight. And additionally, Tempest and E-Star are working on taking out their giants. And we'll see who gets the better trade off of that based on where the first tribute spawns. Yeah. And now that I mentioned that about the mana costs on Tyrael, I believe they're actually like Heroes buffing them a little bit to the point where they're a bit cheaper uh, coming up soon. So I'll be excited for that. because You and I both. Yes, exactly. I've got my little Tyrael notebook to hand with your little Tyrael notes to hand as well. Yes, they are here. <laughs> we are ready for any Tyrael occasion. Exactly. All Tyrael occasions are covered here uh, between Kylaris and Gillyweed. But this is going to be a tribute being challenged down in this position and nobody's been left in lane so both teams are keen to get this one. Tribute up top means that E-Star's Giants get to do more but if they lose Nitra here that's a problem and Duck Duck Ooh. making sure they do using Eldrin's Might to body block and with a 4v5 here we'll see if E-Star still wants to try to contest this. They know that Thrall is a pretty low respawn timer. Oh. Oh. The follow-up damage from Li Ming that the T uh, Tempest is showing here is really, really powerful. I mean, they've already got a lot of damage anyway when Sonya's blading away on top of someone, and that was obviously to Thrall's detriment. But now they're going to just back off, and they've got themselves the trip. And they didn't lose too much down to the bottom so far with these giants being annoying. Yeah, it was great to be able to get a kill off of that as well as the tribute. Uh, with Li Ming, too, you mentioned her damage, and mm. that is going to be catapulted a lot because she did get Triumvirate at level 4. Oh, yeah. So as long as she's making sure to hit those orbs at max range and... And because she has such a good front line to stay behind, yeah. then she should be able to make sure that she's continually being able to fill those out and stopping any tribute pickups potentially. Precisely. And as they said, as you said, as well as on the desk there, unless the flank comes out, Li Ming is fine. The front line will hold. Uh, unless it all dies. Uh, but aside <laughs> from that, it will hold. And Li Ming will be a happy wizard in the back. She always says it. It's better to be a wizard than a mage. Sorry, Kale, Fast and Jaina. Well, I think she'll be just fine unless <laughs> maybe there is like an aggressive fly, right? Yeah, yeah. That would be the one thing. A flank from Thrall. But yeah, it's up to Lockdown. And Lockdown can obviously be a very good player. Who knows to make sure he's in the right position not to get hit by those.
Yeah, I think uh, even Wolf was saying that how much he's a big fan of Lockdown's Falstad uh, to the point where he wanted him to hold a Stormlord Falstad skin. Uh, but for now, it's going to be another uh, tribute fight as NT here in the thick of things. But at the same time, Regar was quite far forward and he will fall to the pressure here of E-Star. Gets some damage down so he can get the self heal. But now is in trouble again as more members of Tempest are rotating into this fight. But a lot of them are very low. Muradin is going to fall. Tiger and Xiao Qi ensure the destruction Ooh. of Li Ming. Sonia drops and maybe an overcommitment there in the rotations after they lost somebody. That was a scrappy fight. Scrappy yeah. fight overall and Tempest do get bodied for it. Rightfully so. Uh, in the end, Eastar really takes advantage of that one. And they're just going to send everybody off to their lanes, capture this tribute. And the thing is, I really like that they delayed the tribute capture of that slightly. Because with them sending everyone across the lanes now, they're going to be closer towards level 10. Meaning that when the third tribute comes up, it's almost guaranteed for them because of the timer starting just as that tribute gets picked up. Right, they'll have their heroic abilities, which means they can get a free tribute, potentially even an early boss if they have that big of a lead. Yeah, yeah. They can get there, but Tempest trying to get back out into their own lanes, making sure that they don't get too far behind from experience. But that that early fight, losing that many people this early on is, is a problem for sure. Yes, it is. Temp is not in the most comfortable position at the moment. But the, by far, when you've got Tyrael on this map, anything can happen. Uh, Holy Ground, level 16, very important to even contend bosses. Of course, sanctification being very important as well. Here comes the tribute. Level 10's almost reached. They're going to try and go on towards Kumi. That's a nice little storm bolt there to start things off. Does he have barrel roll? I don't think he even needs it. He gets away anyway. Yeah, he does have a well tap too. Members of Tempest now are just going to push up here in top. They know that they can't really get into the tribute fight, despite the fact that it's in a good position for them. And, and Leeming is at least delaying for a while. But members of Eastar are coming up here. And Duck Duck is going to fall again. Yeah, go for it was already used there. by Stingsley. That's going to be two going down here. E Star uh, playing like stars here to start off this first, uh, first uh, third game, I should say, here in this series. Tempest has had very good rotations in some of the games that I have watched, but one of the times that I saw TNL be able to take a game off of them in the series where Tempest ultimately won was when TNL kept up with them in rotations and caught them trying to do too much. They had Leeming in the bottom, delaying ETC from picking up the tribute. Eastar realized that, hey, not everybody is here. Obviously, they're up here because Falstad is hanging out with them, so let's just send people up and we can get kills off of it. And they have been the ones who have been able to capitalize on the mistakes of Tempest. Yeah, Hyde was doing what his name suggests, hiding for a little <laughs> while down towards the bottom from potential flank, but uh, Tempest wasn't quick enough to rotate around to maybe push the three man of E-Star away or get a kill. So E-Star just backs on out. They're fine. ETC towards the mid was uh, very close to Muradin there for a moment, but he likewise doesn't really engage either. So as per usual, uh, Shingsi has picked up Wise and Duelist at level 7, so he's building up stacks. He already has, actually I can't quite see how many stacks that he has, but he has uh, about halfway there. And yeah. the thing is, normally they like to build these stacks with Uther and with Tyrael. And without being able to have those, these palms have got to be on point when they finally get into big team fights to make sure he stays alive. Oh yeah, definitely. He's about 12 or 15% at the moment in terms of extra bonus there with that, as you mentioning. Uh, and we do have that tribute now being contested towards the top. A little bit of an advantage here for Eastar. Ideally, they would like to delay this out so they could get 13 and then rival this. But that might be a little bit difficult. So we're going to see them trying to contest it as quickly as possible. Ooh. Tempest wants to fight here because not only are they at the even talent tiers, but if Eastar gets this tribute, it's going to be a curse. That was a lot of damage done by Li Ming to start things off there. Onto three members with the Triumvirate all, but and actually hitting them very, very quickly. Duck Duck in the thick of things. Drops his sanctification already, and they're looking to put on pressure towards Force. That doesn't really do too much. They're thundering as well as Gus to try and push them away from this, and Eastar will just back away. The thundering was a great time. It was a perfect timing. It was as soon as sanctification stopped to be able to make sure they could all escape and get Gauti, healed back up. Gauti. Here they come, a big monster, oh. but it gets canceled. Instantaneously forced out, a wave of force out there, so he's not going to be able to do much with that at all. It looks like Cincy just managed to get away. Oh, but no, the, the uh, stealth wasn't enough to get him away there at that level four. So that's going to be one kill going over to Tempest. But Duck Duck goes down too. It's a one for one as he tries to throw down Archangel's Wrath. Whoa. Gauti, that was an early palm. Yeah, it was, but they might not even need it, to be honest with you. Yeah. They're still putting on a lot of pressure. They've got a lot of sustain available to them. Thrall benefits so much from his Frostwolf's resilience that he's going to continue that on. That is the curse going over to E-Star, and they will put on the pressure against Tempest. Even though it was an early palm, it was really the best choice for them to try to focus down and allow Zhao Ti to get back. They pick up the tribute. Now they have a curse as well as 13 talents. That's very strong stuff 
from E-Star. And even, I mean, they technically can make so much happen from this. They can get themselves the entire outer wall of forts from there and get a significant advantage in uh, levels. And don't forget, Toomey this whole time has been stacking season marksmen over halfway to completion. Yeah. And with being able to take out minions super fast, as that's going to help him get even further along during this curse. Of course, things his uh, stacks were reset from his Wizard of the Jewel list, of course. So he's not going to have as much power behind him, but you're right. That is very, very important. Forster, uh, Wave of Force there was used to actually try and push back ETC and NT as they will be able to get away. But it was, you know, they could have found something from it. Two forts down, one fort nearly down too. I would say that's a successful curse for E-Star. Um, but Tempest are about to get level 13. Still, there is a good uh, amount of experience advantage for E-Star, and they can look toward getting level 16 talent. They're in the boss. A little bit ambitious here. There could be the rotation quite quickly. And that's a, still a full health boss. And they make sure that it stays unleashed. So now they're still continuing. They can't do that. There's no way. They will back away. Back off and get the bruisers instead. The consolation prize of being surprised out of yeah. getting their own boss. But it's, it's pretty risky. Both sides have uh, some good abilities for trying to control that zone. Of course, it gets better for Tempest once they can get Holy Ground at 16. Though. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Even if you have to burn Holy Ground and Sanctification to make sure you're not going to get gusted away and your opponents can't step on the circle, it's probably worth it in that instance to take a boss away from them. Although you might then get team wiped. It really depends. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the concern at the throw yeah. pits. But no bosses still taken in this game just yet. East are very content Whoop. to try to look for picks. They Ooh. may have found one right here. Yeah, they may have, Dami, but he still have Mystical Spear. Can he get away over the wall? He's not even going to go that way. And actually, Ancestral Heal does hit on him. They go three away, but that's not going to be enough. Palm already lands there on towards Doomy. And that's a mosh pit, but it's not enough. The explosive power of Tempest coming out there. Able to kill off three so fast. Thinks he falls as well. And NC on the retreat with that win. Fury. Can they chase him down? I think oh, he might be able to get away. Stop ball. It lands. That's going to be a full team wipe, Gilly. Oh, my goodness. What a huge team fight for Tempest. And it came down. We're going to actually look at it again because it was so crazy. But the, the mosh pit was canceled out by this great sanctification. And so they just threw down so much damage off of that. Even starting out, the, the mighty gust and the sundering were kind of at a weird spot together. And yeah. it was around the corner, so they didn't get a kill straight off of that. But man, MVP of that fight, Duck Duck for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, even on the other side, I mean, we saw Lockdown doing so much damage to ETC to force out that mosh pit from continuing because he just killed ETC. Right. Like, that was uh, got blown up under that. And that was, it was a great mosh pit, but overall it wasn't enough. And it's so, exactly what Tempest needed. Now yeah. they've caught back up in experience. They have one tribute over E-Star and they have gotten 16 at the exact same time. Tempest are back in this game. Yeah, just based off that fight alone, what a fight coming out there. But it comes off the back of E-Star's aggressive tendencies. They didn't necessarily have to go to that hard camp. They just wanted to furtherly extend their lead. The Tiger's going to radiant dash in towards Hyde there, slowing him down. Holy Ground's already been used. Those three are locked in there against that. Sanctification's been used on Tyrion and Honkono. Trying to put on pressure against this. Lee Ming, look at that, blinking forward. Don't prop the palm on towards Karazim. And look, Lockdown still doing big damage on towards him. And he will end up falling down. Tyrion died off. That's a one for three at the moment. Tempest! Turning this game around, Gilly. I think he went back into the fight to help Toomey, and they got a kill on Lee Ming too, but they still lost Toomey, and only one survivor oh. for E-Star. Tempest, with this one fight, is turning this game around, now winning the team fights, getting ahead in experience, and looking to get the first boss of the game. Absolutely and completely. And one thinks to yourself, oh, E-Star, if they had that lead, God, just keep hold of it and don't go so aggressive there. It's allowed Tempest to get back into it as quick as one, two, three. And now this boss easily going over to them. I don't see how only Regar alone could ever rival that. In the Gold League Grand Finals, there was a battle, or there was a fight on Cursed Hollow and Easter was in the lead for MVP Black and then had a very similar throw, throw in a fight. It was at a boss. They were ahead and they didn't need to fight. And again, maybe it's just that they get so excited that they have these leads that they get just a little too eager to try to widen the leads when they could play the patient game, wait until 16 and then pounce on Tempest. Honkono, level 16, heavy impact. 
So now he's stunning things with his Dwarf Toss. Not even going for give him the axe, which has become a little bit more popular now. Not even going for Stone Form. He just wants extra stuns. As they're going to end up moving forward here, Honkono, will he actually jump forward? No, he will not to try and get that locked down. No pun intended. As Toomey's going to fly away uh, down towards the bottom for a moment. And of course, 16 is such a big power spike for Tempest. They have Mirror Ball for Leeming. It's a lot more damage and Nerves of Steel for Sonya. So now she just gains so much more survivability and they're trying to make something oh. extra happen with the spot. Oh. Dami gets Ancestral Heal though. A bomb goes down on Nitra. They're not going to pop it. They're not going to pop it. And actually, the NT is going to actually move away there for the moment. They did get Sonya during all of that. Sanctification is going to be activated as well to try and push on against this. The boss is still there, still vibrant. As Tiger goes very low and locked down. Blinks in with Calamity there to try and get the finish off. It's two for two at the moment though, Gilly. It's two for two, but with the full sad kill, Tempest makes it three. They bring down Greymane too. Oh and God. now it's only Shouts he left in a holy ground, gone. keeping him from getting back. They're going to team wipe Eastar. Oh, and they're going to get this keep as well. Tempest. Oh my God. The turnaround in this game has been phenomenal from them. They get one team fight win and then they don't drop the ball. Two more team fights afterwards. Four kills, five kills. What a game by Tempest. And with that now, looking at their Storm talents, they've taken down a keep and there's a tribute up, allowing them to get a curse oh on their God. own side, put further pressure toward E-Star. That's it. Everything lines up so beautifully for them now. And it all began here, all began in this location. And easily they will be able to take this one delaying the tribute as well. They're so confident about this that they're going to allow this to push just a little bit further whilst this tribute gets secured. E-Star is like, we are never invading the Bruisers no. again. No, because ever. That's based, that one move alone has basically put their entire series in jeopardy. Yeah. If, if they are not able to take this map, which they were in such control of, Tempest right now is pushing in such a way, they've left it for Li Ming at the back to secure because they're so confident about their position in the front oh spot. Yeah, they have, are going to be able to get not only a tribute, but giants to push along with in this bottom lane. Of course, the structures are not oh. firing during this curse. And not even Repulsion taken at 20, it's Talrash's element. So Lockdown is looking for massive blow-up potential from his entire combo, uh, and it will work wonders if they're not careful here, as long as he's mixing up which spells he's playing at each table single time. Oh, I mean, if they can just get through a mosh pit by dealing damage, the sanctification has been there. ETC may go down here before he even oh. gets a chance to mosh. Oh, and they actually do force the palm there for just a little bit of extra damage coming in at the very, very end. And that will be a tower also falling. But look at this. Tempest moving in very, very aggressively on the right-hand side. ETC not there yet. But Eastar got out away from the Sanctification. So now they do know that that is down. But it bought time for Tempest to take oh, no. out the keep. Honkono, he looked on towards Doomy. He almost got him. He actually managed to get away there. And that's going to be a mosh pit carrying two of them. Ancestral healing going on towards one, though. Then the back is Doomy here. Trying to do damage on towards Lockdown. Doesn't quite get him at all there. And it will be uh, not a lot of damage now coming out from Dami. So putting on pressure. They're going on towards caught here at Tempest. They're going to lose everyone. I don't know if they're going to be able to do this, I don't actually. think they're going to be able to do it. Hide is down, but they're oh trying. Sonia is they're still on. Sonia has so much damage. They're going to get it. Tyrion is down. percent they get it. Oh. Tempest wins. They go up two to one in this series after the turn around. And E-Star have to be absolutely livid after the start that they got here on Curse Hollow. I did not think they were going to take out that core at all, but it was oh. Sonya still up. They focused on Rhaegar, but Sonya was still alive. And Sonya just can do so much to that core at that point. And Eastar, how how do you even keep your composure? How do you keep uh, keep going and be motivated? I mean, let's talk about that core just for a second. Even small things like Tyrael's Holy Ground couple up for the perfect storm of events. And uh, yeah, not that wasn't intended either when it comes to the ten name Tempest. They were able to block out them from attacking them around the core yeah. just to get that little bit of extra damage done. But for now, Gilly, we're going to send it over to the panel to see what they say about that fantastic game number three.